Well, the opening uh, verses of chapter 2 uh, conclude uh, chapter 1. And um, a guy named uh, Stephanus uh, in the 16th century when they started printing Bibles is when he, he's the one guy that gets to decide chapter and verses. And uh, so uh, he didn't do well here right at the beginning because um, the first three verses of chapter 2 fit with and should be with, with chapter 1, the concluding uh, overview of the seven days of, cre of creation. There's actually a technical term. It's an echo called an inclusio that is supposed to be part of this opening thought. Um, uh, God creates the heavens and the earth. Uh, they're without form uh, uh, and they're void. So then you have three days of creation talking about that formation. You have three days, the next three, talking about uh, they're being filled and we talked about those days correspond, day one and four, two and five, three and six. And then the concluding statements are here uh, in verses one to three of what uh, is mistakenly actually chapter two. Uh, when we talk about the, the, the seventh day, and keep in mind that in the text it never says Shabbat or Sabbath, it's seventh day. Uh, but that becomes critical and important, we'll see, because it is called holy and it becomes unique. And we'll talk about some of its uniqueness uh, in a moment. Uh, and then it becomes a pivotal, the day of worship, of course, under the Mosaic Covenant with the, uh, with the Jewish people. Uh, we'll look at that. And then we'll get to uh, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 4, then quotes this passage and makes reference to it. Uh, in regards to our, uh, our own salvation. So it has uh, uh, very uh, immediate uh, implications for our own relationship with, uh, uh, with the Lord. Uh, confused uh, also because of the fact that you get, when we get to this idea of, idea of Sabbath day, and again, uh, sometimes I'll say in Hebrew it's Shabbat, and we just actually say it uh, in English as Sabbath and, uh, and so I'll, I'll kind of float back and forth and say it the proper way as well. So at least you're familiar with the term, both, both having the, uh, the same meaning. And sometimes, you know, even, even locally, we'll have great confusion over how to pronounce certain words. And we just get used to saying that. I remember when I first came, uh, moved back to the islands uh, as a young guy. And I, I would always just, you know, hear, you know, is it Hawaii or Hawaii? And I, I finally you know, got my nerve up and I asked somebody that I figured probably ought to know. And I said, which, which is it, Hawaii or Hawaii? He said, he says, it's Hawaii. And I said, thank you. He said, you're welcome. So it didn't, <laughs> it didn't really help me out. You know, we still kind of struggle with these things. So Shabbat, Sabbath, they, they, they both work. There's the other uh, whole idea of you've got uh, Protestant uh, churches uh, in the Western world, including the United States, have, that somehow take this Jewish idea that we'll see as a sign of the covenant with Israel, and somehow they, they bring it over into a New Testament uh, setting and then say that Sunday becomes the new Sabbath. Nah. I'm sorry, that's wrong. It's just, it's the, it's the seventh day. Uh, we worship on Sunday because that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead in fulfillment of two Jewish feasts. He rose from the dead on the day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is always worshiped or celebrated on a Sunday. And um, that's why we, the early church, uh, remembered the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the fulfillment of the Feast of Unleavened Bread on a Sunday. Uh, and then when you get to Pentecost, always worshiped on a Sunday, you have the church birth as the Holy Spirit is poured out. So those are the, the reason that we worship uh, on a Sunday uh, is because of the fulfillment of those two Jewish feasts. Uh, because there, there, are, uh, there is one particular denomination that meets on, a, on the Sabbath, on a Saturday. Uh, and they say they do that because the rest of the church is wrong. Because they claim that in the 4th century under Constantine, uh, in order to kind of placate the pagan gods, he has them begin to worship on Sunday in order to honor the sun god from which that day is, uh, uh, is named after. And uh, we have a theological term for that. It's called baloney. <laughs> it's from the Greek baloney. But, uh, <laughs> but that's just not true. It, it goes back to this, this whole idea. So there's a lot of confusion even when we say Sabbath uh, Sabbath day, and uh, hopefully this will 
clear some of those things up for us. Well, let's look at the first three verses of chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. So again, you've got this concluding statement to the things that we've been studying uh, the, uh, uh, the last couple of three weeks. Uh, and the first thing we see about God resting, uh, as I mentioned, it was a day that was uh, unique. Now, Kenneth Matthews notes uh, several things. Uh, the first thing, there was no creation formula, and God said, because his uh, creative word was not required for this day. Uh, to the uh, seventh day, had, uh, did not have the usual closing refrain, and there was evening and there was morning to indicate a day's end. Uh, the seventh day was the only day to be blessed and be made holy by God. The seventh day stood outside the paired days of creation because there was no corresponding day to it in the preceding days. As we saw with the, the days of forming and the days of filling, there's a direct correlation, one to three, two to four, and five uh, to six. Uh, unlike, uh, or excuse me, three to six, unlike this, uh, the six creative days, the number of the day, seventh day, is repeated Three times, so it's this is a unique day, and uh, and it's very very important. It gets carried over into the relationship, becomes critical as a sign of the covenant with the Jewish people through whom the Messiah would come, and then the writer of Hebrews, as we'll get to chapter four uh, here in just a little bit, he then quotes this passage. It's very important that we understand what it means when it says his work was done, that it was ceased, and why he made it holy, why he made it unique. It actually has a lot to help us understand our own relationship with the Lord uh, in terms of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Uh, let's go back here and keep go rolling along. God rested on the seventh day. It's the second uh, thing we notice about it, verse 2 and verse 3, uh, each state that he rested from all his work. Verse 3, he added... It adds, he rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Uh, and in the Hebrew, uh, transliterated into English, uh, it's interesting. Line one would say, so God finished by the seventh day his work which he had done. Line two, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he had done. Line three, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Line four, because on it he rested from all of his work that God created to do. So what does it mean when it says that he rested? Well, it's not that he's taking a breather. <laughs> well, man, creating the universe, you deserve a day off, my goodness, you know? Had to be worn out over that. You know, even God gets tired, you know? No, that's not actually what it means at all. <clears throat> God continues his work of redemption and so many other things. John, in John 5, uh, Jesus talks about uh, the fact that when he, when he heals somebody on, on the Shabbat and they kind of come after him, the Pharisees and religious leaders, and rebuke him for it, and then he quotes from the law and says, hey, it's even uh, legal to pull you know, uh, an animal out of the ditch. It's, it's, uh, there's nothing wrong or against the law with showing mercy to someone. And he says, my father is working till now, and I am working. So God doesn't cease from working, but he ceased from something. And that's what the word rest means. It means to cease from, and he ceased from creation. So he does creation. He creates everything. So again, this is very contradictory uh, to this idea that somehow creation goes on and on and on and on and on. No, there was a point in time where God ceased from it. He did not continue in it. It was finished and it was completely done. And, uh, and if we don't understand that, we're going to miss entirely the whole point of what the writer wants to say to us in, in Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, his rest was one of, quote, deep pleasure and satisfaction at the fruit of his, of his labor. And, um, and of course, uh, God blesses the seventh day, uh, which means that he made it spiritually fruitful. And uh, we see him using the same words in terms of the creation of living creatures and then Adam and Eve, in both cases, adding to that, be fruitful and multiply. And, uh, and he would have it be fruitful in our lives as, as well. He also says that it's made, uh, made holy or, uh, or unique. And 
Uh, to be made holy means to be set apart for God's purposes. Um, uh, sometimes uh, um, I've still got a shop full of uh, stained glass working tools, uh, and, um, and especially when I was, um, they're, not, <laughs> they're not as dear to my heart as they once were. They're pretty much covered with a half inch of dust and some cobwebs. But uh, when I was still doing that for a, a living, if somebody wanted to borrow one of those tools that I use for earning a living, I would say, no, because they're holy unto Tim. <laughs> they are set apart for my purposes to earn a living. And no, go get your own. Uh, but uh, because it's how I earned a living. They were set apart for something. God calls us holy. Uh, it's not because we earn it or feel like it, but he says many times that you're holy because he has set you apart for his purposes. Uh, he can call a place holy because it's been set apart for his purposes. And here he calls a particular day of the week holy. So God rests after this great event. So God rests after the work of his creation. Uh, secondly, we want to jump to Exodus 20 now because there's a, a Sabbath rest that would come. So generations following the fall, the flood, Babel, the patriarchs, the captivity in Egypt, the Exodus, uh, and now we have Exodus 20, Moses, again, our same writer, uh, and starting in verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do uh, your, all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So uh, the seventh day was to be a day of, of complete rest and, uh, and to stop from, from all work. And again, this is part of the instructions from Moses in terms of the law and the Mosaic covenant, the covenant where man would be able to have a relationship with God through the sacrificial system and, and so forth. Uh, no, we note that the Sabbath of the remembers creation. So it was a time when they would stop one day a week and remember, and that's what it says, right? That you would remember that God created everything. Uh, because our tendency is to not remember that, uh, to not stay focused on that. Because God created everything, including the time-space continuum, and he is eternal and one day I will be with him eternally, and I need to set aside a day that I'll remember it. I'll start thinking, this is it, this is all there is it, and I'll just keep working. I'll just work <laughs> straight through the week, because there's always one more thing to fix, and one more thing I need to do, and one more thing I need to buy. And it's, it's never ending, if you, if you left it to, to mankind in general. And God says, you need to stop. And remember, there's more to life than work. There's more to life than just earning a living. And you need to stop one day and remember that I am the creator of everything and you want to be living for eternity and not for the day to day. So very important to, uh, to the Jewish people. Jewish the theologian Abraham Herschel writes, it is a day on which we are called upon to show what is eternal in time, to turn from the results of creation, the results of creation to the mystery of creation, from the world of creation to the creation of the world. And so it's a day to remember the Lord and, and who he is. And um, the Sabbath uh, implicitly inst uh, instructed all humanity that, uh, that life is more than work because that's just where, where we would find ourselves uh, if, we, if we didn't do this. Isaiah is saying about it in Isaiah 58, 13, there the prophet writes, if you turn away your foot from the Shabbat, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Shabbat a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, not finding your own pleasure, not speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride on the high hills of earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Unique. It's a special day to the Jewish people to remember that he is the creator. But more than that, he's, we're to respect the Sabbath rest because it remembers redemption. 
Again, Moses writing in Deuteronomy 5.15. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Why keep the Sabbath day? Because you used to be slaves. Do you remember what it was like? You never had a day off there. All you heard was the crack of the whip every day, long hours. Remember what God did for you. Remember how he saved you. Remember coming through the Red Sea. Remember how he provided for you. Take a day, a week, and remember that God created everything. You should be living for eternity, and he's redeemed you. That's a pretty good message for the church, too, isn't it? But that, that was, what was what it was all about. The, the Sabbath day was also a day of sacrifice. That's when the sacrifices were, were made uh, to the Lord. And Paul makes reference to that in, in Romans 12 when he says, uh, I beseech you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your spiritual act of worship. And there he's saying in a, in a New Testament, New Covenant context is that like their sacrifices on that Shabbat, on that Sabbath day, in particular, the burnt sacrifices, which they would take the animal, place on the altar, and it would be completely consumed. You didn't have to make that sacrifice. It wasn't required. It was something you could choose to do. And in doing so, because it was completely consumed, it was speaking of your total dedication to the Lord. Paul takes that picture and says that's the way it ought to be in terms of our relationship with the Lord. A complete, like a burnt sacrifice totally dedicated to the Lord. And he says, and then you'll know what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Sometimes we, we struggle with this idea of knowing God's, God's will. Paul, Paul says, hey, make your life a sacrifice to the Lord and he'll show you, he'll tell you. But it all keyed on this one particular day, a day in which God ceased from the work of creation because it was completely done. He calls it holy. He calls it blessed. He makes it completely unique from all other days because he's setting this all up so that it becomes the sign of the covenant for the Jewish people so that they'll remember that God is the creator and that God is the redeemer. And, uh, and again, it becomes the sign of the, of the covenant. The third thing, and that's in Exodus 31, 12. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak also to the children of Israel saying, surely my Sabbaths you shall keep for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. It's a sign between me and you throughout your generations to Israel, to the, the physical descendants of Abraham, to the Jewish people. Not to anyone else, it's unique to them. With Noah, there was a sign of the covenant, of course, of the rainbow. With Abraham, the sign of the covenant was circumcision. All the covenants have a sign. This one is the sign of the Mosaic covenant. Uh, Moses says the same thing in Exodus 31, 16. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So, you know, some people, again, get hung up on which day of the work uh, of the week to actually set aside for worship. Paul says, I esteem all days the same. Uh, we have reasons why uh, the church traditionally has worshiped on, on Sunday, and it really shouldn't even be an issue which day you, uh, you, you worship uh, unless you're Jewish. And then, and then because of these commands... Uh, you've, you've got a, a little bit of an issue, but again, uh, we're under the new covenant, uh, which then is the greater or outweighs the old covenant uh, and no longer under the law. Now, uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, we say messianic or uh, Jewish believers that believe Jesus is the Messiah and so forth and uh, are saved by faith the same way we are, and they choose to worship on, on Saturday, on the seventh day, on the, on the Sabbath, because they're trying to remember their own heritage as well as reach out to others that don't know the Lord yet. So it's a unique sign of the covenant with God's people, with uh, Israel. But again, all of that to remind them on that special day, God ceased and completed the work. That's important to remember. And then it becomes a special relationship with the Jewish people so that they would remember that God is the creator and the God is the Redeemer, and um, 
and we're all knuckleheads, so we need something like that. You know, I mean, we just got to, we just got it. We need something like where God says, knock it off. <laughs> At least one day a week, knock it off and do something different, you know, and get out of the grind. And uh, uh, otherwise, man, it's just, you know, life just flies by, you know, and there were, there would never be time, you know, to stop and, and worship the Lord and, and, and consider him and so forth. Uh, we really need it. They needed it, and, and so do we. Well, let's kind of put this in a New Testament context now. So God rests from the work of, of uh, creation. There would be a Sabbath rest that would come uh, in the future in terms of the covenant with uh, Israel on that particular day. But then there's the entering the rest that the Messiah provides for us. If you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 4, it's just uh, 11 verses. It's way too long for me to put up on slides to you, and you might want to do some underlining and, and remarking. I feel like I need to kind of set this up, I think especially reading it in a New King Jimmy. It's, uh, uh, you're going to find the word rest mentioned several times. Uh, he's going to quote from uh, our passage in Genesis. He's going to quote from uh, a reference to the children of Israel and the wilderness wandering and something Joshua says. He's going to also make reference to uh, what David says in Psalm 95 about that. And he's going under the assumption that you know all of that. So he can just mention them briefly and you know exactly what he's talking about because he's writing to a group of uh, Jewish believers living in somewhere in southern Judah. Uh, it's uh, very early on one of the first epistles because there's a concern that they might go back to the temple and continue the sacrificial system, even though they've already accepted the complete work and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. So uh, very uh, obviously Hebrew is very Jewish in its context and, uh, and maybe needs a little, a little help for us uh, understanding it. But uh, uh, I'm going to try not to preach uh, an additional hour just on this passage, but uh, just kind of pull some things from it that uh, relate to our Genesis passage that I think is uh, very, very important. So again, we need to remember that God's very clear that when he finished creation, he ceased from it. It was over. It was done. It was finished. Because if we don't get that, if we got God still working and creating, 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 then we don't have Jesus Christ in our salvation complete on the cross. And we have to keep working and working and working and working to attain our salvation. So that's, that's the illustration he's going to. If God ceased and it was complete, and when Jesus died on the cross, it ceased and it was complete. And there's nothing you or I could ever do to improve upon by our good works, our position before God. That's his whole point. <laughs> he's going to make reference to that. He's going to make reference to the fact that the children of Israel had a promise of rest entering into the land of Israel, but they never entered in, right? Because Joshua gives the good report in Caleb, and what do they get? They almost get killed, right? And, uh, and they did not enter in. So let's take a look at this, and then we'll, we'll go, go back. So I feel like I've got to explain it, read it, and then explain it again to make sure that, uh, that we get it. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. So there's a warning. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. Wow, the gospel was preached to us and to the children of Israel? How did that happen? We'll look at that in a moment. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith to those who heard it. That was their problem. They had a promise, but they didn't combine it with faith. For we who have believed do enter that rest. As he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. They couldn't go into the land of Israel. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place... They shall not enter my rest. God finished from his works, but they're not going to enter. How come? Verse 6. Since therefore it remained that some must enter it, those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying, In David today, after such a long time, 
As it has been said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest by getting them into the land, then he would have not afterwards, David, spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works. It's important that we cease from our works, trying to earn our righteousness as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Aren't you glad I set that up for you a little bit there? But uh, So let's take a look at a couple of things. Well, there's a warning. He's very, very concerned that... Uh, he says there's a promise that still remains, the promise of salvation, entering into the, the, the rest of God. Uh, but he says there's a concern because uh, it's not enough to just know what the promise is. It has to be combined with, uh, with faith. Uh, I, could, I or, or you could share with somebody the facts of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's lots of people, you know, that will actually agree that they believe in God, even believe in the Trinity. They'll even believe that Jesus died for their sins. I mean, there's a lot of people walking around out there that kind of got the basics down and everything, but they're not saved. They're, they're not saved. They might have been baptized as a child. They might have taken communion. They might have done this or this ritual. But they're, they're obviously not, not saved. They really don't know the Lord personally. That's a concern. There's a warning here because there's a promise, but it's got to be combined not just with a belief system, but with actual trust. And so he illustrates that and warns us, let us fear, or, or in some translations, let us be careful. And it means to, to think through this thing sufficiently so that you can understand it. You're saying, I'm trying, but I needed a little more Starbucks this morning. But again, so he alludes to this idea of the children of Israel. They could have entered in. They had the promise to enter in. Joshua was ready to lead them in, but, but they wouldn't go. And we get that from uh, Numbers 14.7. There Joshua says, the land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. In other words, they're, they're toast. Uh, they're, they're, we would say in our vernacular. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And, and they did, because they had walled cities, they had the giants and so forth. But here is the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. And we've mentioned this before, but it's speaking about the, the, uh, the date palms uh, there, the orchards, the honey is coming from the, the dates, and it's really good. <laughs> it's, really, it's really awesome. I was really sad when ours got confiscated uh, coming through uh, New, Jer New Jersey because we forgot to put it uh, uh, in our... Uh, luggage and it was in our hand carry coming back from Israel. It was very, very disappointing, but it was very good. And that's what they're talking about. So the sweetness of the dates, not honey like from beets. Uh, and the milk means that it's got grazing places for their sheep and for their goats that are going to be able to, to, to uh, have all they need to survive and so forth. This is the promised land, but they didn't enter in because they, they were disobedient. And he's saying, in quoting, don't harden your heart as you did in the day of rebellion. So there's a, a warning here that's, uh, that's going out. And uh, because, hey, Joshua said, hey, it's there. Everything that God said. Joshua at the end of his life said in Joshua 21, all of the Lord's good promises to the house of Israel have been fulfilled. Uh, everything he said he would do, he's done, done for us. Again, the warning for, uh, for both of us really comes from uh, Jesus in Matthew 7, 21, kind of a sobering passage. But keep in mind the fact that somebody could sit in a church all of their life and never combine the promise uh, with trust and faith in what God says he will do in terms of salvation. The Lord ceased from creation. It was complete. It was finished. And there was a point in time where we, uh, we can enter into God's rest, not like those guys. We can completely enter in because the work of Jesus Christ on the cross is finished. He ceased from it. 
We can't do any more good works to add to it. That's his point. Now, Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It wasn't simply enough to do the right things, say the right things, even accomplish some pretty heavy-duty spiritual things. It's about our faith and trust in the promise of redemption. Uh, we used to have some... Uh, couple of guys, uh, military guys, and I just almost look at the front row because they always sit on the front row, and they were brothers. And uh, I told this illustration one time that I'm about ready to tell. They came up to me afterwards and said, that was our grandfather. I said, you're kidding. They go, yeah, his stage name was the Great Blondin. Uh, and uh, so I went online, read a little more about him and stuff. But he was one of these guys um, uh, back in the day, the uh, original extreme sports. I mean, he would, you know, climb up on big towers, and uh, he would do high wire uh, acts, you know, from a building to another building in Chicago and different places uh, around the country. But the thing he's really famous for is he put up high wire across the Niagara Falls uh, and then uh, got the press and everything uh, there and uh, not only walked across it, he pushed a wheelbarrow across it and everybody's applauding and everything comes back again. Uh, and he says to the crowd, uh, how many of you think I can do that again? Oh, yeah, we all think you can do that again. Okay, who wants to get in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> And that's what Jesus is asking us to do. It's not just saying, hey, I agree, you did all that stuff. He's saying, well, yeah, good. Will you get in the wheelbarrow? Will you really give me your life? You're saying I'm the Messiah. I died for your sins. I'm the creator and the redeemer. And you're going to remember that, that I ceased from, uh, from creating all creation. I've set aside a day to help us remember that. But do you really trust me? And will you trust me with your life? Because there's that danger, like the children of, come on, the children of Israel, they walked through the Red Sea. They, they had the, the, the Shekinah glory of God. They had the pillar of fire at night. They had the cloud by day. They had God's presence right there. It's like, what do you need? <laughs> it wasn't an issue that they believe in God or believe God's presence was leading. It's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's like right, right there, right there. Just look that way. <sighs> yeah, I think God is God with us. I'm just going to look that way a little bit, but not too long. I don't know sure what happens if you stare. You know, it's like they had a fear of God. They had a belief in God. It wasn't an issue. But when push came to shut, did they really trust God? And the writer here says, take the warning. Don't harden your heart like they did in a time of rebellion. And again, his whole point, then he quotes our passage in Genesis to say, Jesus Christ finished everything on the cross in the same way that God finished all of creation and he rested. And now we can rest uh, in him. If we believe, then we've entered that rest. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not resting in ourselves, in, in what we can, we can do. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm glad I don't have to rest in me. I'd just be really tired spiritually. <laughs> That's not it. It's resting in Jesus in his finished work on the cross. Again, on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work, which he had done. And, uh, and again, it's finished. We can enter into it. It's combining these things of faith and trust with the promise. There's a story of Hudson Taylor of when uh, he was uh, making several trips, of course, over the course of his lifetime from Great Britain to, uh, to China. And uh, at one point in time, they were on a sailing ship and uh, they were stalled, there was no winds. And so the captain, knowing of the reputation of, of Hudson Taylor, comes to him and says, uh, will you pray that God would cause the winds to come up? And Hudson Taylor said, will you raise your sails? <laughs> like, do you believe? It's like, you put your sails up, I'll start praying. It's like, do, do we really expect God's going to, going to do something? Is there a trust combined with, uh, with the promise? When we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior, we come into his rest. Jesus said this in Matthew 11, familiar passage. Maybe it'll have a little more meaning now. Come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus offers us rest for our souls, speaking about salvation and redemption and his finished work on the cross. But will you come to me and accept it and combine faith with the promise because Jesus ceased from his work on the cross when he was done in the same way that God the Father ceased from creation on that seventh day, made it holy, made it blessed, set it apart as unique because he needed that to teach the children of Israel something unique about remembering God that he is the redeemer and the creator so that Jesus could come along and actually fulfill the whole thing in terms of resting from the work of salvation for us. Amen? Does that help? Next time the devil beats you up over you're not such a good Christian, just, just kick him out. You know, just, just, just tell him, forget it, buddy. You know, I already know that Jesus did it all. You know, that's what we say when, Jesus, when the devil comes knocking on the door, let Jesus answer it. You know, because we can all suffer condemnation because we all struggle with sin at times. And we're going to keep struggling until we're with the Lord. So there's a present rest we enter into. That future rest, of course, is heaven. Where Paul says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. Neither has it entered the heart of man. The things of God is prepared for us. They're too awesome. And it's going to be a glorious day. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we can enter your rest. And we thank you that you're the creator, the redeemer, and loved us so much. You sent the Messiah to die for our sins. And with his death and his burial and his resurrection, he did everything for us to be saved. We don't have to continue to earn it, to strive towards it. It's something that we're to rest in. Lord, and we thank you that we have a day to worship you. And we remember that you rose on the first day. We remember the church was born on the first day when your Holy Spirit was poured out. Lord, and we want to, as Paul says, esteem every day the same, though, just to worship you every day, to remember you, to cry out to you. Lord, so we just pray for that continued work in our lives. But Lord, we're thankful for the rest that we have in our souls. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.